Uh, we used to see him with an air gun shooting birds at uh, the animals. No one thought of her. We used to see him with chicks. An- Still, just just the birds. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to I Could Murder a Minnesota episode number 60. Uh, we're in the 60s, guys. Grandma's getting frisky. <laughs> number 60. There you go. Lovely stuff. Bingo. <laughs> Bingo. Mm. Yeah, it, we, it has felt we've been in the 50s for a while. I guess it's because of true news and other bits and pieces in a week off. But we finally reached the 60s. I want to say a big uh, welcome to a lot of the new Patreonies. See, the numbers have kind of rocketed up a little bit. So welcome. And obviously a big welcome to the OGs. This week is a big one. Uh, it's really good to have you back. Thank you. you no, it's really, it's great. It's really, it's very good to have you back. Yeah, and, and also just on a personal note, welcome back. And thank you so much for everyone. The content in between uh, with me and producer Dan, um, thank you for understanding that. I, I have recovered from those mild asthma attacks that that, uh, that crept up on me. <laughs> Pen attacks. Yeah. Uh, multiple I saw, times. saw the footage. Yeah, it was bad. It was bad. I'm all doped up on uh, antihistamine right now, so fingers crossed, touch wood, it doesn't happen again. Personally, I don't think it's anything to do with antihistamine. I do. Yeah, me and Tom have been falling about out about this. We <laughs> did have a discussion about so it. So Tom's advice. I think it's asthma. But, uh, but they can go, they can trigger each other a bit and make it worse. Spring, farmers in the fields, it kicked off that kind of time. It hadn't happened it did stink out there. It's not very dusty in here, Dan. You keep it quite nice and tidy in here, so I don't know. Thank you. For a compliment, and then maybe he won't argue with me. Who knows? Hello, guys. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, we'll get back to the boys in a second, but I'd just like to take a moment to thank this week's sponsor, HelloFresh. HelloFresh are now part of the IKMAT family, and we're so excited to tell you about their brand and their business uh, and how actually they've changed <laughs> my life. So come on in. So if you're anything like me and you're always fairly uninspired when it comes to dinners, this is where HelloFresh come in. And if you're looking for inspiration or a kickstart into a new routine of dinners, fresh, delicious, quick, simple dinners, then HelloFresh is your, your, is your people. <laughs> so the point of HelloFresh, if you don't already know, is they take the stress away from cooking lunches and dinners for you. They have an array of recipes online that you can pick and choose from, veggie, meat, whatever you like. And they package these ingredients up fresh, send them to your door, you take them in, unpack and cook your dinners. It's as simple as that. And the amazing thing is, is they will break down and send you these fantastic recipes. Look at these bad boys. So that, so this is this is what I chose actually. This is, uh, this is on my HelloFresh order. Veggie bean chili, delicious. Uh, ciabatta pizza bread, amazing. Two cheese ratatouille pasta bake. And I have to say this one uh, was an absolute game changer. It's now become my favorite meal. But the beautiful thing is, is they will send you these recipes, they will send you these ingredients, and they send you the breakdown. And because we partner with HelloFresh, they've given us a wicked discount. It's 50% off your first box and 35% off your next three boxes if you use the discount code Tom and Ben 50 That's T-O-M with an N, Ben50. So whether you want to kick into a new healthy routine, a new diet, or you just want some easy meals to make, HelloFresh is the one. Please try it out. Please check out our discount code. It really helps the podcast and it helps your diets. And most importantly, because of what's going on in this world, it reduces your waste output. So 50% off your first box, 35% off your next three boxes with our discount code Tom and Ben 50 Go for it. Then why did I go... Tom and Ben 50. Go for it. Ben, this week's Minnesota. Yeah, this week's Minnesota. We hope everyone enjoyed last week's episode, The Suitcase Killer. We're now kind of back in our normal flow, which is exciting. We are returning with the main channel on Monday, the 11th of April, which is a week Monday. So we will have one more archive Patreon episode air on the main channel. Then What's we're going to be? Back. We haven't decided. It was going to be Brooklyn Bridge, but I watched it back and I was like, I stretched that episode out quite a bit. So. Longer than the bridge, some people said. Uh, did they? Yeah, some people. I don't talk to them anymore, Ben. But I was like, that's, that's mean. You see how nice they've been since I've been away? Don't say that shit. And my oh, mum so was like, fair enough. <laughs> so this week's case is a big one. It's one that we have previously contemplated for the main channel. It is, of course, the case of Stephen Griffiths. Of course. The crossbow cannibal. Oh, I'm hungry now. I initially wrote that this was rare but the more i thought about it the more i think it's not that rare killers that give themselves their own nickname hmm. zodiac btk 
Son of Sam. Yeah. Is it rare? I would probably say more given it by the, the press. The press, yeah, yeah. Than they give it themselves. So Stephen Griffiths gave himself the nickname the Crossbow Cannibal. He also gave himself not quite as catchy a nickname, the Bloodbath Artist. I don't like that. But if you say it in a bit more of a Yorkshire tone, the Bloodbath Artist. Yeah. Again? Uh, no. <laughs> Again, for the ones in the back. The Bloodbath Artist. The Bloodbath Artist. And this one absolutely dominated the polls. It came in as a request from Isla Marie Selick. So a massive thank you to Isla. Isla went on to say that her and her boyfriend love the pod. Uh-huh. So thank you so much, guys, and we hope you enjoyed this. I know you like the pod. Ooh. That makes me happy. What? Did you? Did that work? Isla, I love you love the pod. So this case is widely regarded as the worst thing to happen to Bradford since the Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe. And what I decided to do was start this week's case by giving you a couple of quotes directly from the killer himself. Ooh. So the first one is, and you get a lot of pretentious vibes from this case, not from me, from Stephen Griffiths. The first quote is, humanity is not merely a biological condition, it is also a state of mind. On that basis, I am a pseudo-human at best and a demon at worst. I am misanthropic. I don't have much time for the human race. I've killed loads. And then he went on to claim to have eaten a part of one of his victims. That's all part of the magic. So an interesting guy. Stephen Sean Griffiths was born on Christmas Eve of 1969 in Dewsbury, West Yorkshire. He was the oldest of Stephen Griffiths Sr. and Myra Dewhurst. He had a younger brother and a younger sister. His father, Stephen, was a fishmonger and frozen food salesman. And his mother, Myra, was a receptionist. His mother, Myra, quite a character. So she would basically go on to become a convicted con artist who regularly engaged in benefit fraud. Basically what happened was when Stephen was first born, he was quite a bit older than the other two siblings. Money was fine. They're both in well-paid jobs. But when they had two more children money became a little bit tight. She decided to commit various frauds to keep the money coming in, and that would lead her to spend a lot of time in jail throughout Stephen's upbringing. Griffith spent part of his childhood on a council estate in Wakefield, where he lived with his mother and siblings. One neighbour would go on to recall that he appeared to be different from other children right from the off. Why? Well, how? Why and how? Well, Tom, where? Why the why, how, what's and where's are that he didn't play out during the day and you would only see him at night. Ooh. Mm, bit vampire-y. We used to see him with an air gun shooting birds. Then we used to see him taking the animal and dissecting them. It looked as if he was enjoying what he was doing. He wasn't dissecting them bit by bit. He was ripping them apart. That's a big red flag. Big old red flag. Others said that he was a very quiet boy and pretty insignificant. That's me. It's really hard. Yeah, quite harsh. Moira and uh, Stephen Sr. went on to divorce when uh, Stephen Griffiths was only 13, leaving him and his younger siblings to stay with their mother, despite her criminal background for fraud. Another interesting note about Moira, so Griffiths was quite a bit older than the two younger siblings. Yep. When he was 13, he developed a strange and disturbing habit of watching his mother have sex with multiple men in their garden. So his mum, did she have multiple guys at the same time? That's a good point. Question. And in the garden. In the garden, multiple men. I'm assuming multiple different men at various... Different times. T- different times. He's just watching through the curtains. Yeah. But yeah. we can't rule out a, a all guns blazing orgy in the garden. It's because cold, we don't cold know. It's out there unless it's a really nice day. Mm. Said June. Wakefield. So despite going into his mother's custody, Stephen Griffiths Sr. would pay for Griffiths and his brother to uh, basically go to a very highly regarded private school named the Queen Elizabeth Grammar. Both uh, of them were regarded as nerds at this school, which I thought, if you go to a private school, does bullying still happen there? Yeah, or are they a bit very much so. Very much, probably even more. You want, you've changed your tune just then, you? Immediately backtracked. And <laughs> <laughs> I actually think it's more. Uh, but a lot of things happen at private school, don't they, which we don't want to get into. With a former teacher claiming he was a very quiet and isolated individual, and he also said he was pretty insignificant. What? What a thing to say. Yeah. In, yeah. In, about a kid. But maybe about a kid after he's committed crimes, and he's yeah. probably, so maybe there it's just a bit of a fucky term. Because rather than going, oh, he was a card. He made, oh, made me laugh a few times. He's a naughty boy. Sounds cooler than going, he meant nothing to me. However, on multiple occasions, he did bring into the school with him a rather vicious-looking dagger and some throwing stars. Oh, wow. So that's another red flag in my book. Throwing stars just feels nerdy, doesn't it? Dwight. Yeah, it feels very Dwight. What year was this? This is kind of the mid-80s. 
As a teenager, Stephen would regularly shoplift whilst under the influence of alcohol. And on one particular occasion, Stephen slashed a clerk's face with a knife when he attempted to stop him from stealing. This attack resulted in him being arrested and sentenced to spend three years in youth custody. Wow. Basically juvie. Um, uh, what was he stealing? I don't know what he was stealing. Um, he did develop a bit of a dependence on alcohol at the time, mm. so it could have been spirits. Get your cider. Bacardi Strong and Coke. Cider. Bacardi and Coke. Yeah. Yeah, one under each arm. Yeah, but then where's he holding the knife in his mouth? I'm trying to slash the prices. Yeah. So he yeah, goes on to spend a three year uh, sentence. Um, he was only 17. That's a long time. sentence, isn't it? The commas in there. Every paragraph. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I'll stop. I've been away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's fine. He was assessed at Rampton High Security Hospital, who deemed him to be not a risk to society. Probably have to ramp up security when he came they, in. It was rampant. What was security? At Rampton High, yeah. Okay. During his time serving this sentence, he lost contact with his family and told probation officers and psychiatrists that he fantasised about being a serial killer. But he's no danger to the public. It's a peculiar thing. We've had it in a few cases where someone's gone on to say... Either I have the urge to kill or I want to be a serial killer. They tell people these things and they just kind of brush it off as being, I don't know, this bravado or, or, or what, but you think that's when they go, okay, maybe we should extend the sentence. You want to be what? A serial killer. Let's talk about this. Well, okay, what else is there to say? Why do you want to be a serial killer? Because I often spend time with people that really fucking annoy me. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. And how does that make you feel? Uh, annoyed asking stupid questions well, why don't you redirect that annoyance into something positive okay like what like an art form and there you go that's how David Gray started <laughs> the white ladder was him getting out of that state of mind he, yeah, becomes very, very uh, obsessed in the world of true crime, very obsessed with serial killers and mass murderers. And very soon after his release, he was again brought back to youth custody due to carrying an air rifle around his local community and shooting birds with it. So something he was doing as a child, he's now doing late in his teens. In 1991, Griffiths was sentenced to serve two years in prison after holding a knife to a woman's throat after she refused to go into his flat with him. So this time he's in actual prison. He's already been in a lot of juvenile facilities, secure hospitals. He's now sentenced to spend two years. And it's again during this time in prison that he begins to collect books and articles about serial killers in order to study them in a more efficient manner. So he'd be in and out of that prison library. Why the prison library has got content about serial killers and mass murderers, I do not know. I was just thinking just that. He mainly focused on Jack the Ripper, the Moores murderers, the Acid Bath murderer, and the Acid Bath murderer, you know those little casebook files I've mm. got? It's like one of the front, front of the pile there, so we'll, we'll have to have a read of that one, Just Tom. a really powerful bar form. I didn't know! And the Acid Bath murderer actually went to the same private school as him. Oh. Probably about 100 or so years before, but still, that two is too many. And his personal favourite... Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper. After serving this two-year sentence, he would remain unemployed for the next several years and live off grants and benefits, despite being a highly intelligent individual. So not only did you need money to get into this private school, but you needed to hit a certain... He's smart. ...academic evaluation or, part, I don't know, maybe there was an entry exam. Probably that. Probably that. So he's very bright, very intelligent, but... Doesn't Lazy. Want, ...doesn't want to work, yeah. Pig ignorant. In 1990... Ignorant. In 1998, Griffiths began dating a woman for two years, but the relationship came to a quick end when he invited her to his flat and she found every single surface covered in plastic. Ooh. Another red flag. Mm, very Dexter. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you watched it yet? Need to start it. You need to. Dan, have you seen Dexter? I started it, but I couldn't f carry on. Did you not like it? No. There's quite a few levels to it. You're saying you're a dumb fuck. No, I'm not saying you're a dumb fuck. I'm just saying. The first few series I'm, I very much enjoyed. Kind of lost its way a little bit towards the end. Maybe I need to try it again. Is it still going? Uh, they did that one-off series which had similar elements to it as... Robert Hansen? Yeah. A lot of um, recent cases we've covered either on the main channel or Patreon as well have always said you really need to watch American Horror Story. Yeah. But I've, again, similar. I tried it and I just couldn't get into it. He begins dating this this uh, lady. It's his first real serious relationship because he's not... In, you see childhood photos of him. He's not a bad-looking guy. Um, he's bullied a little bit, called a nerd. He's got some strange habits. But he begins dating at the age of 29. Fact, Dating's not for everyone. No, exa exactly not. But every service being covered in plastic. That's maybe why his mum was fucking in the garden. <laughs> yeah, she, she broke up with him. She found him a little bit strange. 
Later on, Griffiths would go on to date another woman, but she broke up with him because of his abusive nature. This would weirdly result, he didn't take the breakup, either of the breakups particularly well, but this second relationship he had basically resulted in Griffiths stalking and harassing her and her family for two years. Did he harass her as well? <laughs> so this basically, yeah, basically resulted in her harassing her and her family for years, including spray painting the word slag over her car and her family's house. Well, apparently at this time, it was alleged she could have been pregnant uh, oh, with no. his baby. So very, very angry. He also apparently abused her pet dog, which she didn't take take very well. Both of the girls found him quite abusive. He wouldn't let them see friends or family, wouldn't let them answer the door without his permission. Um, and he also spiked their drinks with various drugs. Oh. There is a very, very, and this is part, because I, I was a little bit familiar with the case, but mainly due to kind of some surveillance footage that we'll talk about in a little bit. But there's one part of this case that I was not aware of. After all this happens, they get one of his ex-girlfriends to do a statement and she has a voicemail from him from back at this time. Ooh. This particular voicemail that, that I heard, um, basically, he goes on to leave this second relationship, loads of voicemails, loads of really creepy voicemails. But this particular one, he goes, I'm not going to go away, so I guess you'd better. And then he breaks out this, it is terrifying, this laugh. I don't know if you can find it. Can you Dan. deliver it a bit? I'm not going to go away, so... I guess you'd better. I'm not going to go away, so I guess you'd better. <laughs> no, I can't. I can't pull it off. It's fucking terrifying. It scared me. Honestly, so just compare the two. If you can. Don't, well, you yeah. don't have to, but... <laughs> fucking hell. Jesus Christ. Um, so Stephen would blame his hatred of women on the fact that his mother abandoned him when he was a teenager but she didn't really abandon him she got sent to prison yeah, she went in the nick for trying to get money for the family right she went in the nick for trying to get money quick in 2001 Griffiths began to drink heavily and take drugs he moved into a one bedroom flat called Homefield Court which was just on the edge of Bradford's red light district literally the street outside where the red light district apparently ends um, <laughs> apparently you <keep> pretending <laughs> An area that the Yorkshire Ripper, his idol, Peter Sutcliffe, used to frequent. You're gonna like this next part. Okay. I promise you. you built it up, bark up. It's at this point that Griffiths also bought two lizards and frequently took them out for walks on harnesses. So he'd walk around all dressed in black, looking like Neo from The Matrix, with two lizards on a lead. Was it a duster jacket? Big duster jacket, yeah. Do you remember when I tried to put your dog on a harness got it the wrong way around? Upside down. It was yeah. quite, it was cute. Somehow it shat from his mouth. Did he name the lizards? Uh, I haven't got the names available, but it, I mean... Dan, name the lizards. What are you naming the lizards? Sunburst. Sunburst? I wasn't expecting that. No. And Gary, I don't know. Okay. Sunburst and Gary. Okay. Uh, Leopold and Artie. Nice. I saw Artois, and I thought I can't say Leopold and Artois, so I'll go Leopold and Artie. Good. Tom? Good. Uh, I'll probably go for um, Iceberg and Cabbage. Lettuce. Well, what's Cabbage, but... I spoke. Let us continue. Good to have you back, man. I know. That was the st type of stuff I was really missing the last couple of weeks. <laughs> Vegetable <laughs> jokes. <laughs> Not only would he walk them around the town on dog leads, he would also place them in a backpack and take them clubbing. Oh, fucking hell. So I imagine he's peacocking with them, basically. Yeah, USP. Have, uh, have you met my lizards? Have you met Cabbage and Lucky? Uh, Iceberg? Lucky. Uh -huh. That would spook me. Yeah. One of his neighbours, so he's in a big block of flats. It's quite a cool block of flats that he's in. It's a former mill, so it's all been converted. It's quite rustic looking. But one of his former neighbours, Rachel Farrington, was invited to his flat and saw Griffiths feeding live rats to his lizards. His former friend, Billy Parkin, stated that he once saw Griffiths eating a live rat whilst he fed his lizards. In 2003, Griffiths earned a bachelor's degree in psychology and would then go on to enrol at the University of Bradford for a PhD in criminology. Being unemployed, Griffith spent a majority of his time on the internet researching various gore sites, true crime websites and serial killer websites, downloading violent and aggressive pornography. He also quoted criminals on his MySpace account. His username was Ven Pariah. Pariah is like a demonic lingo for outcast. And I'm guessing Ven is because he's Stephen. I don't think he wants to go by Steve. A Venn diagram. Or Stephen. Yeah. I was thinking that. So he spent six years working on a postgraduate thesis about serial killers. He became obsessed with serial killers and mass murderers throughout this period of time. In the summer of 2009, his obsession with serial killers now starts to boil over and become reality. 
on June the 22nd, 2009, Griffiths took 43-year-old sex worker Susan Rushworth, who was also a mother of three from the Bradford area, to his flat and killed her before dismembering her in his bathtub. After she failed to return home the following morning, Susan's mother became concerned and called the police. A missing persons report is launched, however, Susan is never found. Ten months later, on April the 26th, 2010, Griffiths picks up 31-year-old Shelley Armitage, who was also a sex worker from Bradford's Red Light District. Literally, his flat is on the walkout and he's there. At 10.10pm that particular evening, surveillance footage captured Shelley walking up and down Sunbridge Road, likely looking for a client in the Red Light District. After this footage uh, captured Shelley, she would completely vanish. No one ever saw her again. On the 21st of May 2010, just 26 days after Shelley Armitage went missing, Suzanne Blamiers, a 36-year-old sex worker also from Bradford, went missing. This is very much following the Yorkshire Rippers MO, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Susan would become Griffith's third and final victim, but also the most infamous one. During the early hours of May 21st, Stephen Griffiths met Susan and brought her back to his flat, where he would then go on to brutally murder her. All three of his victims had heavy drug addictions and were using sex work to fund their habits. Three days after Suzanne's disappearance, a lone dog walker found a black backpack floating in the river. Upon lifting it out of the river, the dog walker quickly realised that the bag was extremely heavy. Once opened, the dog walker discovered the gruesome sight of a badly disfigured, decapitated human head with what appeared to be a crossbow bolt as well as a knife still lodged in the skull and neck. Crossbow bolt. Yeah, so they're like they're like shorter arrows, yeah, but a yeah, bit yeah. more metally. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's horrific. The day after, as a caretaker was making routine checks on a number of surveillance cameras on the building that he looked after, which was Homeford Court, the block of flats that Stephen Griffiths lived in, he was expecting to trace some uh, graffiti artists. Basically, there'd been a lot of graffiti on uh, various walls around the building. Just slag everywhere. He was expecting to be able to trace some graffiti artists. However, what he captured instead was far more gruesome. Don't so want to trace them, mate. She's just stencil, don't they? Oh. The surveillance footage basically records Stephen and Susan approaching the building that Stephen lives in, and they look completely happy. And apparently, he used to bring a lot of sex workers back to there, so it was not out of the ordinary for mm. this to happen. The pair look completely happy together. They enter the building. They then enter an elevator together with all appearing normal. The pair then enter his flat. And just a few minutes later, the same surveillance uh, camera reveals Susan fleeing the flat with Stephen dressed in black, armed with a crossbow, Fuck. chasing her from behind. It is the most fucked up surveillance I think I've ever seen. Everything completely changed. His mm. mannerisms completely changed. Is it quite good quality, Susan? Yeah. He then catches her and shoots her at point blank range in the head with a crossbow bolt. After he kind of catches her from behind, they both disappear from the shot of surveillance and that's when he's mm. he shoots her. The next thing you see is him dragging her Jesus. body back into his flat. He then reappears, giving the finger to the camera and toasting it with a bottle of iron brew. I am waving his crossbow about as well. It's the most bizarre series of events there. Stephen is filmed returning back to the streets a few hours later in what you can basically only imagine was to try and find more women. And he was able to bring one more lady to the front of his building. However, after a couple of minutes chatting, I think she figures out something's not right mm. here. And she's filmed just walking away from him. The un unidentified woman ends up leaving him and for whatever reason goes against entering the building with him. Stephen then ling lingers about outside the building returns to his flat home alone. So the whole reason the surveillance camera was in there in the first place, it had been installed in the hallway because the uh, landlord found out that Stephen had a criminal record. He had been bringing sex workers back quite frequently. They also had heard that he had a bit of a drug habit, so they mm. put the surveillance for the surveillance cameras in the building purely f to monitor Stephen Griffiths. Turns out police had been watching Griffiths for almost two years before he started killing his victims, and they had already seized various hunting weapons from him. I think with a guy with his type of background, he slashed a store manager's throat, he'd put a knife to a woman's head, he'd stalked, harassed his ex-girlfriends. Like, he's got a pretty checkered past. Yeah, again, and he's said that he wants to be a serial killer. Yeah. So they're monitoring all this time, they're confiscating weapons from him. Mm. He's had his air gun taken off him twice, and yet he's able to kill three people. It begs the question when the CCTV, how long the CCTV cameras have been there, if they were there when he killed the others. I mean, he obviously caretaker was checking to see this particular thing, but I mean, in theory, all of that would have been caught. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't know how often the 
footage is erased and renewed or whatever, but it was only this final victim that the second victim you have surveillance of her in the street, but it's from yeah. a different camera from a different building. So yeah, that's a good point. The police contacted the housing association which owned the building as uh, concerns had initially been raised after Griffiths was observed reading books in a local library on dismemberment. Again, there are certain books, aren't there, that are like monitored in libraries. Is there? I'm pretty sure. I don't want to Google it because that'll look... Should I Google it? He'd been observed reading books about dismemberment. The Housing Association shared the police's concerns and had fitted a CCTV system in anticipation of a potential incident. At the time of the murders, police had no evidence for any kind of antisocial behaviour order or anything like mm. that on, on Griffiths. So in terms of the murders themselves, if not counting Susan, the final victim who was stabbed and shot with a crossbow, details of how he exactly killed his victims are unknown, though it is very likely he would fatally shoot them with one of his crossbows and after killing his victims, Griffiths would dismember them in his bathtub and cook parts of their bodies for him to consume. He has made claims that he ate his final victim raw. Afterwards, Griffiths would place parts that he didn't consume in plastic bags and dump them into a nearby lake and river. Uh, they found a head in a backpack in the river. They've got him committing a murder on mm. CCTV. Police have enough evidence to go and arrest him. And when they arrive at the building, he shouts out, I'm inside. I am Osama bin Laden. Right. There's no explanation for that. Apart from, I guess, they were looking for him and they found him. He is taken down to the local police station and interrogated. Some of the interrogation is available online. Police presenting an overwhelming amount of evidence, including video footage of him murdering Suzanne Blamires. Whilst they're interrogating him, forensics teams search the flat and find blood traces belonging to all three of his victims, with the majority being found in both the bathtub and on the stove. Griffiths claimed to have killed many other women, but no other evidence could be found to support this claim. Like he said, there were like dozens that he murdered. Mm -hmm. He wanted to be like his idol. Whilst in custody and whilst being interrogated, he would further confess to eating parts of his victim that were cooked on his stove. However, claimed that his stove broke, so he would eat his final victim raw. A phone was recovered from the flat, which included multiple videos and photos of torture that Griffiths would put his first two victims through shortly before their deaths. And with some of these videos, he would commentate whilst filming their bodies he'd like graffitied onto their back and stuff griffiths would repeatedly describe himself as a bloodbath artist and refer to his bathroom as the slaughterhouse when police were asking for the whereabouts of the bodies as they were only able to recover two of the three victims no remains of suzanne rushworth were ever found this is the woman that the cctv mm. captures everything they never found a body he admits that he killed her but refuses to say to this day where the remains are Griffiths never revealed it, stating that I put the bodies where a robot would. I am completely emotionless. And what sort of location have you put them in? If you can't tell us where, what sort of location have you put them? Can't know. Where a robot, where a computer would put them. Yeah, you know, a rational, emotionless aberration would put it. Why, why did you feel the need to to kill her? I don't know. I don't know if I say just sometimes you kill someone to kill yourself or kill parties. I don't know. I don't know. There's like deep issues inside me. So why did you feel the need to kill any of the girls? Fun? I don't know. I don't know. Just, well, I'm misanthropic. I don't have much time for the human race. Very bizarre. In late May of 2010, uh, Stephen Griffiths appeared at the magistrate's court, and when asked for his name, he simply replied, The Crossbow Cannibal. Griffiths' trial ran for a five week period, and on the 21st of December 2010, he pleaded guilty and he was convicted of all three murders and sentenced to serve, based on the fact that he wouldn't reveal the location of his third victim, a whole life order. We've done quite a few of the whole life tariffs, haven't we? Mm. Since his conviction, Griffiths has tried to take his life on five separate occasions and he's gone on two separate hunger strikes, all of them being unsuccessful. And whilst the surveillance footage from this crime is absolutely horrific, 
he failed to obtain both the number of victims and the notoriety of his idol Peter Sutcliffe and the case remains generally non-mainstream. There's, there's not a massive amount, there wasn't a massive amount of mainstream media yeah, at the time. Much about Despite this, the case is generally referred to as, rather than uh, the crossbow cannibal, the Bradford murders, <laughs> which probably infuriated Griffiths. Yeah. His motives include hatred for women, idolizing Peter Sutcliffe, hatred for his parents and feeling of abandonment, and desire to be famous. When they've made various uh, comparisons based on the geographical area to the Yorkshire Ripper, a lot of people comment on the fact that how quickly technology solved the crime. Because they were saying if he really wanted to obtain the notoriety and get that, that body count as high as Sutcliffe, he would probably have been aware of the camera directly yeah. outside of his... Well, he swore it, didn't he? Well, exactly, yeah, wave his bow about. That's probably why he um, went out again, because he thought that he, it was an amount of time until he was getting caught. Yeah. Surprised he didn't try and... Get access to the room with the cameras in, or the sorry, the footage and stuff in, or, or mm -hmm. even just run away. He, yeah, very calmly went out to try and get a fourth victim, brought someone back, and thank God she decided this guy's a bit. Surely there'd be bloodstains on the floor as well, dragging the body back. Well, that's yeah, that's true. I mean, it, was, it looked like a carpeted floor. He'd obviously put a crossbow bolt into her head. Yeah, you're probably right. You can't, I couldn't remember spotting it on the surveillance footage, but. Maybe they pixelated it or something, I don't know. Although he made those claims when he was interrogated, there are a, a list of potential other possible victims. There's a, about six additional uh, sex workers that went missing at exactly mm. the same time in the similar geographical area, but none of them have been pinpointed to, to Stephen Griffiths. David Cameron, at the time the then Conservative Prime Minister, said that the murders were a terrible shock. He said that the decriminalisation of offences related to prostitution should be looked at again. But he then also added, I don't think we should jump to conclusions on this. There are all sorts of problems that decriminalization would bring. Um, he's still in prison to date. He's not been successful in any of his attempts at taking his own life. He's on a whole life tariff. Pretty dark case. There's lots of footage out there of his interrogation. There's some good documentaries out there. But yeah, that was the case of Stephen Griffiths, the crossbow cannibal. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah, I didn't know much about it considering you know, how infamous he wanted to become. Again, spicy name you're going to have a good chance of winning the polls. Definitely. I have got um, a, a looky-likey. There you go. As I said, as a kid, growing up as well, he's you like... You said he was fit, didn't you? I don't remember. I had Worth a pop. Never raced him. Uh, he'd, so I don't know how win. fit he was. Sorry? He'd win. Yeah. But some of his younger photos, he's Asthma. got... He has long, wavy hair. This is me being very kind to him. He's got a bit of a Heath Ledger from 10 Things That's I Hate About very You. very kind of you. Very kind, but... Can you show me a picture of him? Yeah, of course you can. <sighs> it's literally just the hair back, it's just the it? hair. Yeah, big thank you to Isla and her boyfriend for the recommendation. Dominated the polls and, yeah, very interesting case. Very dark. Whole Life Tariffs. We've done a lot of people on Whole Life Tariffs, haven't we? And we're going to be doing some, some more people on Whole Life Tariffs, so... Until next time, Ben, I guess. I guess. I guess. Dan? He's back on his trailers, isn't he? No, he's, he's got a little llama. Little llama, pal. Okay. Giggles the llama. Anyway, guys, like we always say... We say this all of the time. Keep doing what you did well unless um did you guys do this outro without me yeah yeah wow okay unless you fucking owned it as well mate mm. i feel i feel like it yeah unless yeah. you're play the clip Bonsi. and uh like we always say guys keep no we say this all the time <laughs> uh, unless no you're taking lizards in the back back to the club yeah, I can agree with that. You seen that video of the lizard running on its <laughs> in? A, it's like what is it? A little bit of a meme, but a it's like a, they're showing a bunch of school kids reptiles, and the lizard runs across like a school gymnasium with just his lower legs. Looks like Rango. <laughs> Have you seen it, Dan? I think I've seen it. Yeah, so good, yeah. so good. <laughs> Turn that some guys. Too big. In the lizard. I don't want to say. You'll love it. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs>